Good evening. evening. And welcome to those watching on the internet. Tonight is a, what do you call this kind of topic? A hot topic or something like that? But fortunately it's only part one. There is still a part two. Now the topic sounds ominous. It's the Jesuits and the Counter-Reformation. And I'm not going to deal with the political intrigues and the oaths and all of these issues because I've dealt with that. You will find it all in the first series. We're going to look at the spiritual aspects. And these are all the more serious because they are all the more dangerous. And I would like to venture so far as to say that the whole world has been captivated by this intrigue. And that what we are going to speak about in the next two lectures affects every single one of us, whether we know it or whether we don't know it. It is not my intention to hurt anyone's feelings. It's my intentions to show where these things lead to and where they come from and why some of them are not biblical. And that's not an easy thing to do because some people are sincerely involved in something and really honestly believe that what they are doing is right when in fact they have been deceived. Doesn't the Bible say that the greatest problem or the first principle of the last days will be deception? So we need to know where this all comes from, where it's all leading, and how does it affect me personally in the time that we are living in. Protestantism is not solely the outcome of human progress. It is no mere principle of perfectibility inherent in humanity and ranking as one of its native powers in virtue of which when society becomes corrupt it can purify itself. And when it is arrested in its course by some external force or stops from exhaustion it can recruit its energies and set forward anew on its path. It is neither the product of the individual reason nor the result of the joint thought and energies of the species. Protestantism is a principle which has its origins outside human society. It is a divine graft on the intellectual and moral nature of man whereby new vitalities and forces are introduced into it. And the human stem yields henceforth a nobler fruit. It is the descent of heaven-born influence which allies itself with all the instincts and powers of the individual, with all the laws and cravings of society, and which quickening both the individual and the social being into a new life and directing their efforts to nobler objects, permits the highest development of which humanity is capable and the fullest possible accomplishment of all its grand ends. In a word, Protestantism is revived Christianity. Isn't that well put? I like the way these writers wrote. This comes from the history of Protestantism by Reverend Wiley. And it says, this is not based on some reason. No fanciful thing that man has developed and thought up and based on his reasoning capacities and natural law. This is a heavenly graft. This is something from above and not something from beneath. Now if we want to know about the Jesuits, we have to go back into history. And the Jesuits have probably caused more turmoil on the planet than any other organization ever known to man. They have been banned by virtually every single country where they have ever operated, including the Catholic ones. 
There are very few that didn't ban the Jesuits. And they would always come back and pick up the pieces of a country that lay destroyed and writhing after they dared to cross this organization. The Jesuits, throughout Christendom, Protestantism was menaced by formidable foes. I'm going to read you quite a few quotes tonight. The first triumphs of the Reformation passed. Rome summoned new forces hoping to accomplish its destruction. At this time, the order of the Jesuits was created the most cruel, unscrupulous, and powerful of all the champions of popery. Cut off from earthly ties and human interests, dead to the claims of natural affection, reason and conscience wholly silenced, they, know, they knew no rule, no tie, but that of their order, and no duty but to extend its power. The gospel of Christ had enabled its adherents to meet danger and endure suffering, undismayed by cold, hunger, toil, and poverty, to uphold the banner of truth in the faith of the rack, the dungeon, the stake. To combat these forces, Jesuitism inspired its followers with a fanaticism that enabled them to endure like dangers and to oppose to the power of truth all the weapons of deception. There was no crime too great for them to commit, no deception too base for them to practice, no disguise too difficult for them to assume. Vowed to perpetual poverty and humility, it was their studied aim to secure wealth and power to be devoted to the overthrow of Protestantism and to re-establishment of the papal supremacy. When appearing as members of their order, they wore the garb of sanctity, visiting prisons, hospitals, ministering to the sick and the poor, professing to have renounced the world and bearing the sacred name of Jesus who went about doing good. But under this blameless exterior, the most criminal and deadly purposes were often concealed. It was a fundamental principle of the order that the end justifies the means. By this code, lying, theft, perjury, assassination were not only pardonable but commendable when they served the interests of the church. Under various disguises, the Jesuits worked their way into offices of state, climbing up to be counselors of kings and shaping the policies of nature, nations. This comes from that classic great controversy. And history has borne it out. Here is a quote from 1816 of John Adams writing to President Jefferson and he says, Shall we not have regular swarms of them here? In as many disguises as only a king of the gypsies can assume? Dressed as painters, publishers, writers, and schoolmasters, if ever there was a body of men who merited eternal damnation on earth and in hell, it is this society of Loyola's. That's pretty straight, isn't it? This is history. This is history, and you can check the line through history and see the blood that flowed. And who was always behind it? The Jesuits. Now one of their main aims is to replace this Protestant absolute where the Bible and the Bible alone is the authority and salvation is by Christ and Christ alone with this policy that salvation has to go through the system. So how do you replace moral absolutes with a relativism? This is one of their objects, this is their aim. Hebrews 12, 25 to 28. See that you refuse not him that speaketh. For if they escaped not who refused him that spoke on earth, much more shall not we escape if we turn away from him that speaketh from heaven. We need to be grounded in Christ. We dare not. We dare not be sidelined into assuming something else. 
whose voice then shook the earth, but now he has promised, saying, Yet once more I shake not the earth only, but also heaven. And this word, yet once more, signifies the removing of those things that are shaken, as of things that are made, that those things which cannot be shaken may remain. I believe with all my heart that Christianity is in the shaking period. Wherefore we receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved, let us have grace, whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear, for our God is a consuming fire. Choice. He has a choice to be made. Bear in mind that it is none but God that can hold an argument with Satan. There's too much presumption in the world. Too many people marching around commanding, commanding Satan to do this, commanding Satan to do that. Not even Gabriel could stand against him without calling the one who is what God is, Michael, to come to his aid. How much less we, what presumption we have in the world today, it's unbelievable. Martin Luther versus Ignatius Loyola, the founder of the Jesuit order. They were contemporaries. They lived at the same time. And yet they were so totally different. Luther's appeal was to submit the conscience directly to God through the word. And Loyola's drive was to submit the conscience to the papacy. Here was the distinction. Ignatian spirituality was to be achieved through spiritual exercises by substituting imagination and encounter theology for the reality of faith. He found another way of guaranteeing a spiritual experience which was no longer based on faith, but on the actual substance. Here is a quote from D'Aubergine, the history of the Reformation of the 16th century, probably one of the best exposés on the Reformation ever written. It's huge. Inigo, it's another name for, or short version, of Ignatius Loyola. And uh, the author writes, Inigo, instead of feeling that his remorse was sent to drive him to the foot of the cross, persuaded himself that these inward reproaches proceeded not from God, but from the devil, and resolved never more to think of his sins, to erase them from his memory and bury them in eternal oblivion. Both Martin Luther and Inigo had the sense of guilt both of them chastised themselves to get rid of it. Martin Luther made the great discovery the just shall live by faith. And Inigo did not. Luther turned towards Christ. Loyola fell upon himself. Visions came ere long to confirm Inigo in the convictions at which he had arrived. Inigo did not seek truth in the Holy Scriptures but imagined in their place immediate communication with the spirits. Luther, on taking his doctor's degree, had pledged his oath to the Holy Scripture. Loyola, at his time, bound himself to dreams and visions, and chimerical apparitions became the principle of his life and his faith. Two directions. The one, faith-based. The Lord said it, therefore it is so. So. If you repent, I will wash you whiter than snow. I will remove your sins as far as the east is from the west. And see, we are doing a new thing. That's what the word says. The devil says, you're guilty, you're guilty, you're guilty. The Lord does not lie. By faith, I accept forgiveness in Christ, whether I feel it or not. Inigo said, I want to feel it. I want to feel accepted. I want to know that I can talk with him. I will concentrate all my energy to communicate directly. And before long he was communicating directly. But with whom? With whom? Luther declared, 
It is a light thing to die for the word, since the word that was made flesh has himself died. If we die with him, we shall live with him. And passing through that which he has passed through before us, we shall be where he is and dwell with him forever. Faith. Statement. No need for any strange experience. At the Diet of Worms, he said, Since your most serene majesty and the princess require a simple, clear and direct answer, I will give you one, and it is this. I cannot submit my faith either to the Pope or to the councils, because it is clear as noonday that they have often fallen into error and even into glaring inconsistency with themselves. If then I am not convinced by proof from the Holy Scriptures or by cognitive reasons, if I am not satisfied by the very texts that I have cited, and if my judgment is not in this way brought into subjection to the word of to God's word, I neither can nor will retract anything. For it cannot be right for a Christian to speak against his conscience. Here I take my stand, I cannot do otherwise. God be my help. Amen. That same historical source. So here were two total opposites. It's written, and therefore I believe it. I accept it by faith. Christ said so. It is so. Done deal. Isn't that nice? Isn't that nice? Do I have to prove my relationship with someone else? Do I have to prove every day that there's a relationship going in a marriage? Do I have to prove? How do I prove that I love someone? If I say it, it must be accepted by faith. Here is Inigo kneeling before the Pope, receiving his letters. And all of these things happened more than 400 years ago. The Society of Jesus first constituted in the chapel of Notre Dame, Montremartre, 1534. Now in the chapel of the Sacred Heart in Paris. And there it is. It's quite a magnificent edifice. You're not allowed to take any pictures inside, but it says nothing about outside. So let me take you there and let's have a look at what we can see on the outside. Fascinating place. They have all these magnificent statues and they have these two interesting little engravings here on the building. The first one is the mother hen. Now it's interesting, you must understand their mindset. Who is the mother according to Catholicism? The church, yes. Matthew 23, 37 says, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that kills the prophets and stonest them which are sent unto thee, how often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathers her chickens under her wings, and you would not. Rome says, the church is the mother, and Christ is set aside. Matthew 15, verse 9, on the other side here, they have the this mythical bird, this pelican, feeding its young with its own flesh. Matthew 15, 9 says, In vain they do worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. This is the bloodless sacrifice, the offering of the flesh. Titus 3, 5 says, Not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us by washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. No, Catholicism says we need works and faith for salvation. Protestantism says we need faith. Works are a consequence, not a means to salvation. So if you are a Christian, you will have good works because you are impelled by the love of Christ to do good works. But you do not do the good works to get brownie points in order to get a higher status or even to go to heaven. So there's a subtle difference here between the two. 
Catholicism has them both embodied. Now that's the history. And it is a bloody history. When you go through all the mega wars, the 30 year wars, the massacres of Europe, all the inquisitional activities, even amongst themselves they had so many arguments when the Inquisition was passed from one order to the other and taken away from the Jesuits. Whoo, the poor Dominicans, they were slaughtered. And even after that, they will use it to their advantage and say, look, even Catholic orders suffered, so it couldn't have been us. Are the Jesuits still relevant? Do they still have a role to play today? Well, in this year, we had this interesting election of a new general for the first time in history a Jesuit general retired before he was forced to retire by his death and the new Jesuit general is Father Adolfo Nicolas from 2008 and here are the Jesuit electors these are the inner core of the Jesuit order and it's interesting to read this extract of a letter that Pope Benedict sent to the Jesuits just prior to this new election of this general. So here is the present Pope writing to them. And he writes, I too gladly wish to take this opportunity of a general congregation to bring such a contribution to light which might be of encouragement for you and a stimulus to implement ever better the ideal of the society. Jesuits go and work to get society to the level where we want it. In full fidelity with the magisterium of the church such as described in the following formula which is well familiar to you, to serve as a soldier of God beneath the banner of cross and to serve the Lord alone and the church his spouse under the Roman pontiff, the vicar of Christ on earth. Jesuits that's your job. And then he quotes an apostolic letter from 1515. He says, One treats here of a peculiar fidelity confirmed also by not a few amongst you in vow, in vow of immediate obedience to the successor of Peter, Perinde a cadaver. Good grief. This is Pope Benedict writing, quoting, and, I, and he says to them, Your obedience to me must be as the obedience of a corpse. Perende a cadaver, like a corpse. You will have no mind of your own. Whatever is said, you will do. Blind obedience. The church has even more need today of this fidelity of yours, which constitutes a distinctive sign of your order. In this era, era which warns of the urgency of transmitting in an integral manner to our contemporaries, distracted by many discordant voices, Jesuits, I need you now more than ever, and I need your blind obedience. Is that what he's saying? That's exactly what he's saying before the vote took place. And here he is with the inner core, the electors of the Jesuit order, sitting in the front, he the man in white, and they the men in black. Fascinating. How does he feel about their institutions of learning? This is the Pontifical Gregorian University in Rome, the most prestigious Catholic Jesuit university in the world. And what did Pope Benedict have to say about this institution? He says, well, once again, the Pope entrusts this university to you. A work so important for the universal church and for so many particular churches it has always been a priority amongst the apostolic priorities of the society of Jesus here is your entering wedge this work is for the church and for all the others well let's have a look at how we shall proceed and how they have managed to turn Protestantism into something which does not even resemble primitive Protestantism. Here is 
Adolfo Nicolas, the new Jesuit general, shaking hands with Peter Hans Kolvenbach, the previous general. And it says, Peter, uh, Father Adolfo Nicolas of Spain, the newly elected superior general of the Society Jesus, celebrates his first mass at the head of the Jesuits at the Church of Jesus, January 20, 2008. So this general, the previous general, Peter Hans, Peter Hans Kolbenbach, is the first general in history to be permitted to resign. And here he has been sworn in, made available by the Jesuit Order Press Office. Spanish Reverend Adolfo Nicolas swears in as the superior general of the Jesuits' Roman Catholic Order during their 35th general congress in Rome's Holy Spirit and Sassia Church, January 19, 2008. The general of the Jesuits is always known as the Black Pope because he wears black. And the White Pope is the Pope who is the exterior, how do I put this, the external picture of the papacy. This is the yin yang. The black and the white squares, the knowledge of good and evil. So the new general meets with the pontiff, Rome, 28th, January 2008. And this is Catholic World News. Jesuit officials released a statement after the meeting saying that the conversation between Father Nicholas and the Pope had been warm and friendly. And they reaffirm his personal respect for the Vicarious Christ as well as the esteem of the whole society of Jesus. So this is all being made public. So first you have this letter reminding them of their affiliation and now you have the confirmation. According to the statement from the Jesuit superior, Pope Benedict said that he was pleased to know that the general congregation of the order which continues its meeting in Rome this week will reflect on the message that the pontiff sent to the participants as the general congregation began. So here they are together to reaffirm in the spirit of St. Ignatius its own total adhesion to Catholic doctrine, in particular on those neuralgic points concerning the mind, which today are strongly attacked by secular culture. So this order, is it dead, yes or no? Definitely not dead. This is the largest order in the Roman Catholic Church. This is the most powerful order in the Roman Catholic Church. It is a military order. It has a general at its head. And all other orders have to subscribe to it. Even the great orders of the Malta. Pope Ratzinger to the Jesuits, 21 February 2008. Now I want you to listen carefully what this Pope wrote. And here's the Latin text for those who would like to dispute this. Come straight off their own uh, web page, this Latin text. Here it is translated for you. For this I have invited you today to also reflect in order to find again a sense of fuller obedience to the successor of Peter so that it does not only involve the cases of sending you on missions to far lands, but also in the most genuine, ignited spirit of feeling with the church and in the church, to love and to serve the vicar of Christ on earth, with that effective and affective devotion that must make of you the precious and irreplaceable collaborators in the service of the Universal Church. That's powerful. So the duty is to love and to serve. What does the Bible say? What is our duty? To love and to serve the Lord God with all our heart and with all our soul, with all our mind. Here we have a totally different order. Here we have a human being taking the place of Christ being served as though he were Christ. Now the whole Reformation separated on these issues from the Roman Catholic Church. And finally, after much bloodshed, the Council of Trent came together 
And that was championed by the Jesuits. This is the Council of Trent Conclave. And uh, unfortunately, Martin Luther was already dead when the Council of Trent took place. And my question is this. The Vatican II Council, which we read about, which started in 1965, and which suddenly opened the doors to all Christian communities to be acceptable again, because before that date, it was said that there is no salvation outside of the Roman Catholic Church. You can only be saved as a Roman Catholic. That's why I became an atheist. It's true, because my mother was a Protestant. She was Lutheran. And she died when I was 12 years old. And she took four years in dying. And in those four years, in my religious instruction, I was told repeatedly that my mother, not being Catholic, had no hope of salvation and would go to hell. And I hated God. And I rejected Him. But after 1965, suddenly she was okay. All she had to do was acknowledge the supremacy of the papacy and even the separated brethren could be incorporated. So my question is, did the Vatican II Council change the Roman Catholic position established at the Council of Trent? That there is no salvation outside of the Roman Catholic Church. Well, let's ask the Roman Catholic Church. That's the best way to do it. My quotes, as you will see, come direct from the Vatican. Directly. This is the address of His Holiness Benedict XVI to the participants in the plenary session of the Congregation for Doctrine and Faith. In the old days, that was called the Inquisition, and Ratzinger used to be the head thereof. He, write, he, he says, Your eminences, venerable brothers in the episcopate and in the priesthood, dear and faithful collaborators, it gives me great joy. He starts all his addresses like that. It gives me great joy to meet you on the occasion of your plenary assemble. I can thus express to you my sentiments of deep gratitude and cordial appreciation for the work that your dicastery carries out at the service of the Ministry of Unity. So dear Inquisition, you have a Ministry of Unity to get them all back under the wing of the Mother, entrusted in a special way to the Roman Pontiff. It is a ministry expressed primarily in the terms of unity of faith resting on the sacred deposit whose principal custodian and defender is the successor of Peter. He is the principal custodian of unity. Last year in particular, the Congregation for Doctrine and Faith published two important documents which offered doctrinal clarification on essential aspects of the church's te teaching on evangelization. Let's see where we go. The first document is entitled Responses to Some Questions Regarding Certain Aspects of the Doctrine of the Church. In its formulation and language, it reproposes the teaching of the Second Vatican Council in full continuity with the doctrine of the Catholic tradition. Thus, it confirms that the one and only Church of Christ which we confess in the creed has its subsistence and permanence and stability in the Catholic Church and that therefore the unity, indivisibility and indestructibility of Christ's Church is in no way annulled by the separation and division of Christians. Has anything changed since the Council of Trent? No. It's exactly the same. It's just couched in fancy terminology. This comes from, where does it come from? Vatican.va. That's their own web page. I delight to read what this present Pope has, has to say. And if we would read it, we would not be so confused. It's mind-boggling what he says, but nobody ever bothers to read what he says. The Second Vatican Council assertion that the true Church of Christ subsists in the Catholic Church, dogmatic constitution, lumen gentium, does not exclusively concern the relationship with the churches and Christian ecclesiastical communities, but also extended to the definition of relations with the religions and cultures of the world. And the declaration, digitalis humanae, on religious liberty, the Second Vatican Council affirmed that 
This one true religion continues to exist in the Catholic and Apostolic Church to which the Lord Jesus entrusted the task of spreading it amongst all men. Nothing has changed. The only thing that has changed is Protestants believe that it has changed. Far from preventing authentic ecumenical commitment, this difference will encourage a realistic and fully informed discussion of the issues that still separate the Christian denominations. So the papacy is not hiding it. They're saying, we're the boss, we're the only ones, and salvation is only in us, so when you are joined to us, you better realize it, because you don't accept me as boss, you're out, you're dead, you're lost. They're pretty plain on this issue. Wow. No problem. So let's go towards full Christian unity. There is no doubt about the issue. And when the ecumenical councils say, but you know, Rome has changed. Read what they're saying. They haven't changed. Here's another one. Congregation for the Doctrine of Faith responds to some questions regarding certain aspects of the doctrine of the church. Here is the official mouthpiece of which Ratzinger was the head. Levada is now the head. Bishop of uh, San Francisco. First question. Did the Vat Second Vatican Council change the Catholic doctrine on the church? Let's ask them. Straight. They're doing it themselves here. It comes from their own webpage. Response. The Second Vatican Council neither changed nor intended to change this doctrine. Rather, it developed, deepened, and more fully explained it. Clever. This was exactly what John the 23rd said at the beginning of the council. Paul the 6th affirmed it in his commented on the act of promulgating the constitution Lumen Gentium. There is no better comment to make than to say that this promulgation really changes nothing of the traditional doctrine. Isn't that plain? Absolutely crystal clear. Thank you. We know where we stand. What Christ willed, we also willed. What was, still is. What the church has taught down through the centuries, we also teach. We haven't changed. I hear so much, but they've changed. They've changed. Here they say they haven't changed. In simple terms, that which was assumed is now explicit. That which was uncertain is now clarified. That which was meditated upon, discussed, and sometimes argued over is now put together in one clear formulation. This is how it is, accept it or else. Now, how did they get this doctrine into all the Protestant churches? And how did they get their Protestant churches to change from what they believe to what they practice now? Protestantism used to say, here is the Antichrist, and therefore we will separate. Now they have another Antichrist who hasn't even come, Pro probably will come when they're not even there, so why should they bother about it? Or he's already dead. You know, it's just total chaos. And what have they got in, their, in the place thereof? Well, the Jesuits, entrusted with the spreading of this new dogma, of course it would be the Jesuits, the most important one was Karl Rahner, 1904 to 1984, and Vatican II. Now we must study their doctrines. And who was his special co-worker? None other than the present Pope. They were both architects of Vatican II. Karl Rahner is undoubtedly the most important Roman Catholic theologian in the 20th century. His seminal position amongst his contemporaries results to some extent from his ability to put theology and philosophy into dialogue. This is very dangerous because once we start turning truth into philosophy, we can go anywhere. We can go anywhere. And philosophy is the thing that trips up the intellectuals. Wonderful. Karl Rahner originated a new religious category. Anonymous Christianity. Isn't that clever? Saying it embraces Buddhists, various other non-Christians, and even atheists who are conscientious, upright, and caring. They're all right. They're Christians. 
Some kind of faith in God is basically there, whether they know it or not, says Rana. They are part of the Christianity that does not call itself Christianity. Pagans who have received grace, but who are not aware of it. That's beautiful. Everybody is incorporated. Everybody is embraced. All you have to do is say, Papa, and you'll be okay. Do you recognize these two gentlemen in this picture? Kalrana and Paparazzi. We shouldn't call him Paparazzi. We, should, we shouldn't really do that. Two progressivist shirt and tie priests at the Vatican II, Father Joseph Ratzinger, was a co worker with Father Karl Rana at the council. Here the two of them are together. Please note what Rana said. Rana's motto was effectively, our Lord must conform to the world, not it to him. Hmm. His influence was enormous. He satisfied a modern world, a modern churchman, whose ears were itching for doctrinal compromises under the precept of enlightenment. Here was a new philosophy. I thought I'd throw our Redeemer Lutheran Church webpage in here, which sort of defines where we're standing. I'm not going to read the whole thing, just which doctrines are necessary for unity? Dr. Richard Bucher, both in the 16th century and ours, it has been assumed that agreement in every church teaching is not necessary for unity. Separate Christians, separated Christians, need only agree on the essentials or necessary, or fundamental doctrines. We just have to have a few points of contact. Do you believe in Jesus? Yes, I believe in Jesus. Is he the only way to salvation? That's not relevant. We at least believe in Jesus. Muslim, do you believe in Jesus? Yes, he was. Oh, wonderful, he was a good prophet. And so we have points of contact. Well, how far do you go until you have absolutely nothing left? Right. Now, what is the aim of Protestantism? And what is the aim of the Jesuit order? The aim of Protestantism is to spread the gospel of salvation in Jesus Christ, to spread the good news. The Messiah has come. Come, all ye who are weary and heavy laden, and he will give you rest. Not Jesuitism. I cannot too much impress, says Nicolai in the history of the Jesuits, upon the minds of my readers that the Jesuits, by their very calling, by the very essence of their institution, are bound to seek by every means, right or wrong, the destruction of Protestantism. This is the condition of their existence, the duty they must fulfill or cease to be Jesuits. That's why they were called into existence. Accordingly, we find them in this evil dilemma. Either the Jesuits fulfill the duty of their calling or not. In the first instance, they must be considered as the biggest enemies of the Protestant faith, and in the second, as bad and unworthy priests, and in both cases, to therefore to be equally regarded with aversion and distrust. Straightforward talk. Now let's have a look how the world has changed since Vatican II. What have they done with this new theology of embracing everyone? The Second Vatican Council and the Charismatic Renewal. Did you know that the Charismatic Renewal really only started taking off after the Second Vatican Council? Here is Pope John the 23rd who called that council. On the 25th of January 1959, only two months after his election as Pope, John the 23rd surprised the world by announcing the council to give the church the possibility to contribute more efficaciously to the solution of the problems of the modern age. The joyful echo brought about by its announcement, as well as the lively interest on the part of non-Catholics and even non-Christians, wow, here we have a total ecumenism, proved in the most eloquent manner that the historical importance of the event has not escaped anyone. Vatican II and the charismatic movement the cardinal appointed to oversee this issue and who served on most of the committees was Cardinal Sunens. <laughs> cardinal Joseph Sunens, he's a Templeton Prize recipient. Well, there's an interesting connection. You'll have to look at the previous one. 
He was also a Mason. He was initiated on June 15, 1967. He was chosen by Pope John the 23rd to be one of the chief architects of Vatican II. He sat on all four major commissions. He stated, since I've had this charismatic experience, my allegiance to the Holy Father as the vicar of Christ in the world has been heightened and strengthened my appreciation for Mary as the co-redemptress and mediatoress of my salvation has been assured and my appreciation of the Mass as the sacrifice of Christ has now been heightened. All of those points Protestantism rejects. And yet this charismatic experience led him into embracing these doctrinal errors even in a greater fashion. This is what Vatican II has to say about the charisms. It is not only through the sacraments and church ministries that the Holy Spirit sanctifies and leads the people of God. Please note that statement in the first place. So if you partake in a sacrament, you get sanctified. So an action sanctifies. There's no salvation by these works according to the Bible. He distributes special graces amongst the faithful of every rank and the manifestation of the Spirit is given to everyone for profit. These charismatic, charismatic gifts, whether they be the most outstanding or the more simple and widely diffused, are to be received with thanksgiving and consolation. For they are exceedingly suitable and useful for the needs of the church. Isn't that fascinating? So this is what Second Vatican Council had to say. Let's embrace this because this is going to help our church. Pope Paul VI speaking at the International Conference in 1975. He says 1975 marks the year of the renewal coming of age in the Catholic Church. And he told them, nothing is more necessary to this more and more secularized world than the witness of the spiritual renewal that we see the Holy Spirit evoking in the most diverse regions and milieu. How then could the spiritual renewal not be a chance for the church and for the world? And how in this case could one not take all the means to ensure that it remains so? Who's behind the charismatic renewal of, do you've read these? And the Pope himself spoke in tongues. 1975, Pope Paul VI is giving his address and Christianity Today reports bishops, archbishops, cardinals struggling to keep their hats in place, sang and danced in ecstasy, embracing one another, raising their arms to heaven and Pope Paul VI address was punctuated with ecstatics. He spoke in tongues and here is this mega movement. Alberto, one doesn't always know how Perfect, these quotes are, but uh, this is historically at least accurate. He says, Catherine Kuhlman was one of Rome's greatest undercover agents, assigned to penetrate the Pentecostal and Protestants through the charismatic movement. She was a master of hypnosis and had tremendous psychic power. As a reward for her outstanding work, she was granted a private audience with the Pope. As a result of her work, most now teach unity, but seldom preach separation and holiness, which Rome dreaded. And that's a fact. Here is a picture of Catherine Kuhlman as she spoke to the people and healed them, much like the televangelists heal people today. And here is a a picture of 1907 to 1976, 20th century American faith healer. She believed in miracles, deliverance by the power of the Holy Spirit, and was part of the Pentecostal arm of the Protestant Christianity. Here is Protestantism receiving this infusion. She was known for her healing crusades. In fact, Time magazine's one called her a veritable one-woman shrine of Lourdes. If you want to be healed, go to Catherine Kuhlman. She was given an honorary doctorate by Oral Roberts University. Well, I don't want to go there. You can look at my previous DVDs to see what all that is about. And it's fascinating that in 1973, Benny Hinn attended one of her healing crusades. 
And this was the catalyst for his ministry. It is thanks to Kuhlman that we have slain in the spirit experiences in the world today that she made popular in evangelical circles. Homer Duncan, the ecumenical movement, gives this description of the 1975 full gospel convention. Now notice here what Catherine Kuhlman had to say about the papacy and how, this is Protestantism speaking, supposedly. At the Full Gospel Businessmen's Fellowship World Convention held in Anaheim, California, this was 1975, this is the same year that the Pope spoke in ecstatics. Various speakers from different denominations used such expressions as charismatic ecumenism, the Lord's ecumenism, charismatic Eucharist. The emphasis on reconciliation with all churches was a major theme and charismatic Catholics were prominent on the program. Catherine Kuhlman said, quote, I want you to know that Pope Paul VI would have fit in very well with this great worldwide convention. He would have understood everything that was happening. He would have understood this is part of God's great plan. I believe the charismatic movement has been duped and used as a mega drive for unity. After all, if the outpouring of the Spirit is the same, then it must all be good. Roman Catholic priest John Bertoluzzi spoke at the same one. He spoke about Holy Spirit baptism. He said, during the week we have charismatic mass, just a gorgeous experience of worshiping the Lord in the midst of the Holy Eucharist. He continued, but you know the Lord is doing a whole new thing. He's pouring out His Spirit on all flesh, all denominations, on everybody. And this is the Lord's ecumenism. Fascinating. All roads lead to Rome. And this is what they use. The Free Presbyterian Church of Scotland. And I want you to note what this man has to say. Here is the Free Presbyterian Church of Scotland's clerk to the Synod. And he wrote when these things were happening, and this was in 1975, that's not so long ago. This is what he had to say on behalf of his Protestant church. He was the clerk of the Synod. He said, the ecumenical movement which you praise, and he wrote this to the Times, and they published it. The ecumenical movement which you praise is the greatest disaster to affect the Christian church this century. It has reduced the professing churches of this country to a collection of bloodless, spineless, and boneless organizations which can hardly raise a whimper on the side of Christ and His truth. Small wonder that the evil progresses as it does and spiritual darkness becomes more intense as the years go by. You appear to regard a body of professing Christians of sober conduct and deep spirituality of mind as fanatical and bigoted. See, gets turned around. If you believe in the Bible, you're a bigot, you're a fanatic. But if you believe in the experience, you're a Christian. If this be so, then the eminent men of God, such as John Knox in Scotland, John Calvin, Martin Luther on the continent, Archbishop Cranmer in England, were bigots and their contests with the error of popery. We are glad to be in such company, he said. I'm afraid those voices are gone. We don't find voices like that anymore. No, the hype gets bigger and bigger. Pope John Paul II and the charismatic renewal what they are saying just boggles the mind. Here he's meeting with some half a million representatives of various churches in 1998, and he boldly proclaimed, Open yourselves docilely to the gifts of the Spirit. Accept gratefully and obediently the charisms which the Spirit never ceases to bestow on us. Whatever comes, take it. What does the Bible say? Mustn't we test the spirits? Is this thing from God or is this thing not from God? No, the Pope says, whatever comes, just take it. This is what we need. 
And how many are there in the Catholic Church? If you don't believe the Catholic Church is behind them, look at their charismatic bishops. Good grief. Well, these are their priests. Charismatic priests from different movements met at the Vatican in 1990. This comes from inside the Vatican. There they are. This is the drive. The bigger, the better. Catholic Charismatic Movement, Pope John Paul II Address to the Pontifical Council for the Laity, 1999. We have experienced the grace of a new Pentecost. There are many signs of hope which have flourished for the mission of the church, among which are the discovery and the appraisal of charisms, the renewed zeal for evangelization and the advancement of lay people. This is a movement, let's walk amongst the people, work amongst the people. In 1998 he said, this is Pope John Paul speaking, Come Holy Spirit, come and renew the face of the earth, come with your seven gifts. Come Spirit of life, Spirit of communion and love, the church and the world need you. Come Holy Spirit and make every more fruitful the charisms you have bestowed on us. Give new strength and missionary zeal to these sons and daughters of yours who have gathered here. Open their hearts, renew their Christian commitment to the world, make them courageous messengers of the gospel, witnesses to the risen Jesus Christ, the Redeemer and Savior of man. Strengthen their love and their fidelity to the church. Sounds nice. Then he stated boldly, the movements are the hope of the church. And Cardinal Ratzinger said exactly the same thing. He said it is Pentecostal hour. Now what's basically wrong with this? The Bible says that the Lord Jesus Christ would go to heaven and that the disciples were to wait for the outpouring of the Spirit which would come from him. Whatever you ask in whose name? My name you shall receive. For our Heavenly Father, and then he tells the story of will he give you a whatever in the place of, and then he talks about stones and fish and bread, and he says our Heavenly Father will give you the gift of the what? The Spirit. If we ask in the name of Jesus, God will bestow the gift of the Spirit to minister unto others in spreading the gospel. That was the aim. Here we have a direct access to the Holy Spirit. Christ is set aside. And this is not biblical. Meeting with the ecclesiastical movements, Pope John Paul II said, with the Second Vatican Council, the Comforter recently gave the church which according to the fathers is the place where the spirit flourishes, a renewed Pentecost instilling a new and unforeseen dynamism. Whenever the spirit intervenes, he leaves people astonished. He brings about events of amazing newness. And so he goes on and on and on. We need the guidance, the charisma. It is not only through the sacraments and the ministrations of the church, but through this outpouring. And the present Pope adds his voice before answering questions from an assembly of more than 100 bishops. He says, I have had the joy and the grace to see young Christians touched by the power of the Holy Spirit. At a time of exhaustion, when there was talk of a winter of the church, the Holy Spirit was creating a new spring. The challenge today is not to allow the faith to withdraw into closed groups, but to have it enlighten everyone and speak to everyone. How do they get this right? How do they manage to open the doors for the Spirit? And here comes a clue. Rome, May the 7th, 2006. This is a Catholic source. More than 10,000 members of communities of the Catholic Charismatic Renewal will observe the vigil of Pentecost with Benedict XVI. And this is what they said. The unknown God. The Holy Spirit considered until a few years ago as the unknown God is the one who with his grace tirelessly changes the lives of thousands of people in all corners of the world who with renewed joy through the experience of baptism in the Spirit begin a new life precisely in the Holy Spirit, they said. So here we have a move 
and away from Jesus Christ and his centrality from whom are all things to a direct worship of the Holy Spirit. And we sing interesting songs and we invoke the Holy Spirit and we talk to him and we pray to him and we say come and do this for me and this is not following the biblical avenue. The biblical avenue is no one comes to the Father except by Christ. So the centrality of Christ has been shifted. He is the one we wish to honor. Talking about the Holy Spirit. He is the one we wish to honor and glorify publicly. Responding to the appeal that both John Paul II as well as Benedict made. The CCR and the whole church to spread the culture of Pentecost and the actions of the Holy Spirit in the life of the church. And in each of the faithful, the director added, this celebration which will include moments of prayer. Now I want you to listen carefully because it gets sneaky. Moments of prayer, listening, witness and invocation of the Spirit will end with a celebration of prayer. A music concert, a dance which will be presented as prayer by artists of different countries. What have we got? We have a liturgy. We have a mode of action in the place of faith. Fascinating. And where's all this come from? Father Renero said, pontifical household preacher and Father so-and-so, one of the initiators of the charismatic experience, will speak on grace and the power of the Holy Spirit during the celebration. Fascinating. So here is a movement which has changed the face of Christianity, which has refocused Christianity in a totally new direction. And it's highly experiential. Now the Jesuits prepared the way in this world by first working away and chipping away at the moral absolutes of Christianity. And one of the ways they did it was through the hippie movement. So here you have the hippie movement of the 60s where everything went, when drugs came into this world, free love, all of those nice things. The Jesuit people, the hippie movement, was led by the Jesuits such as McSorley. When you saw those little cars where the drugs were being handed out, the Jesuits were never far away. McSorley from Georgetown University, a Jesuit university, this led to the anti-establishment Jesus with the long hair, the let your hair down philosophy, the love gospel, the liberation gospel, the prosperity gospel, the coffee house Jesus, the rock and roll Jesus, the existential Jesus who meets the needs of all cultures and creeds. So here we go. Let's get with it. And you thought the hippie movement is dead. It's not dead. Today the hippie movement is incorporated into organizations and these sprang out of it like the green peace movement isn't that fascinating and you have all of these friends of the earth movements and the action coalition and the american civil liberties union and the Greens peace international and the global recycling network and the u.s fish and wildlife services and the socialist party and mega organizations have come out of that movement and here was McSorley. He used to stand on the street corners. He was arrested. He was the forefront leader. Here he says, should we then take life or should we, you know, death, hate, whatever. Here is Jesuit priest, professor at the University of Georgetown University. He was a Marxist priest. And who were his students? Bill Clinton was his student. Fascinating, it is Georgetown professors who advocated that Clinton go for a Rhodes Scholarship. And what else was he? He was the mentor of the whole Kennedy family. So here he was, an activist for all of these things. Here, this is the voice, this is Georgetown University's own webpage talking about McSorley, and it says, that he was, uh, he had Bill Clinton in his class and that he was 
the mentor and friend and confidant of the Kennedy family. He was also associated with Martin Luther King. And please note what he said. He says about Martin Luther King, I saw him as a great Christ figure. So I followed him and marched with him. King explained the meaning of the gospel to me. He taught us that Jesus was serious about nonviolent love, racial justice, peacemaking. King showed us how to live the gospel as well. Isn't that interesting? So all of these activist movements, the Jesuits were behind them. And then the music industry and the rock industry, which had its simple beginnings with groups like the Beatles and all of those. And here you have the Beatles and their songs about Lucy in the sky with diamonds. You remember that? And what does that stand for? I'm sure you all know. It stands for LSD and the drug world. And all of these movements, the Jesuits were behind it. Nietzsche's nihilism. Nihilism is the notion that ethical norms are nationally unjustifiable and a consequent mood of despair over life's emptiness is the result. Who creates the emptiness? Who brings the drugs and says there's no purpose to life? If you take away absolute morality and you take away the Bible, well then there's nothing left. So you have free love, existentialism, here you go, and anything goes. And then you come to the point where you realize, well, I'm blowing my life away. What's the point in all of this? And then you supply the lack. And here's the danger. Nietzsche defined the concept of the situation which exists when everything is permitted. And this drug world was important. In the Rick Martin interview with Eric John Phelps, Phelps claims that the Beatles were Jesuit controlled and that the drug world is controlled by Rome via the Mafia, which is Jesuit controlled. Here are the Beatles with their drug songs. The Beatles were the first rock band to use the Devil's Triad on a record album. And there you can see it. There he is using it and there even animated. So there's no chance here. Van Helsing states that the Beatles used backtracks and this is what he says, Song Revolution number 9, message, start smoking marijuana, turn me on, dead man, referring to Jesus. John Lennon in 1962 said to Tony Sheridan at a star club in Hamburg, I know that the Beatles will be successful such as no other group has been, I know it for sure, because this success I have sold, for this success I have sold my soul to Satan. This comes from Jan van Helsing, Geheimgesellschaften und ihre Macht, and it's a quote from him. And then you have this philosophy shift, bringing in a new philosophy. And Heidegger's caring brought into this, this nonsensical world. God is dead, therefore life's answer lies within the self. Have you heard that on television these days? Self-esteem, Christian psychology supplies the lack. Heidegger taught that the soul would then authenticate itself by showing concern for others or caring. So now you have a caring Christianity. Heidegger's existential caring, Sorge, to take care of others, is based on Dasein, to be there. So here I am, I'm in a mess, how do I get myself right? How do I get a form of spirituality? I take care of others. This is the religion of self, the religion of Antichrist, God being removed. The church sets the standard and educates coaches, the masses through Christian psychology, spiritual directors, neuro-linguistic programming, caring labs, until we have a new spiritual formation. There's a summary of where we are headed. Now let's see how they did it. Step two, create a new morality. Change the direction. We have to get now from this nonsense, this nonsensical existence, into a sensible existence. And who's behind it again? The Jesuits. And you can look them up. Here is Father Gustavo Guterres. And let's learn from Catholicism via this man how we must take a clear stand against social injustice in favor of the revolutionary process. 
Uh huh. So we change our religion from worshiping Jesus, from having a God centered religion, to having a social religion. Leonardo Boff, the church must be defined in terms of energy, charisma, and progress of the world. So says Richard P. McBride. I always like to know who are these people? Uh, McBride, who are you? And why do you quote all these Jesuit people? Well, here he is. Let's see. Richard P. McBride is Crowley O'Brien, professor of theology at the University of Notre Dame. Hmm, very interesting. Past president of the Catholic Theological Society of America. Interesting. Distinguished achievements in, in he received the Murray Award, and he served as past on-air commentator on Catholic events, on CBS, so he's a big man. Where was he trained? Oh, the Pontifical Gregorian University in Rome, the Jesuit University. Didn't the Pope say, uh, you gentlemen, <laughs> you better change the world through these institutions? Let's see what the man has to say. He says, the mission of the church is one of service to the people, especially the poor, the oppressed, and the marginalized. Although the structures of authority are necessary for this mission, those structures are always subordinate to it and are to be judged by their capacity to enable the church to fulfill the mission. Here we go, we've changed our religion. We need soup kitchens, we need this. Is there anything wrong with a soup kitchen? Absolutely not. Is there anything wrong in uplifting someone? Absolutely not. But if that is your religion, then you have changed faith for works. It must be a consequence. And we will see what the difference is. He writes, from the feminists come the view of the church as an exodus community. So here we have feminism, that's fine. Called to abandon the established social order and its religious agents of sacralization and to witness an alternative social order. Let's change the world. He says we must be change agents, servant model for the church, gospel by application of the gospel to the struggle for social justice, peace, human rights. Excuse me, is this the gospel of Jesus Christ, yes or no? Definitely not. We have a new gospel. The church's activities on behalf of social justice of human rights are not merely preparatory to the real mission of the church as the notion of pre-evangelization had it before Vatican II. The church's commitment to and involvement in the struggle for social justice, peace and human rights is an essential or constitutive part of its mission. This is our job. We have to preach social order. No. We have to preach Jesus Christ and him crucified. We have to preach salvation by him and him alone. We have to preach repentance. We have to preach justification. We have to preach sanctification. This is not the gospel, this is a new gospel. Matthew says, take heed that you do not your righteousness before men to be seen of them. If you want to do good, do it quietly. If you want to help someone, then do it without boasting. While they claimed to be very jealous for the honor of the law, self-glory was the real object which they sought and Christ would make it manifest to them that the lover of self is a transgressor of the law, says this Protestant writer. So let's prepare the mind for this new spirituality. And now we're going to get to the dangerous part. I'm giving you the history, slowly. And when we get to the next lecture, we'll see where we are. It's scary where we are. Do you know about the spiritual exercises of Loyola? How you achieve spirituality? Now remember, this is written 400 years ago. And I'm not going to read the whole thing to you, but I will show you the essence of it. I've downloaded the whole thing. I could talk a whole lecture just on this issue. This is Ignatius Loyola, the founder of the Jesuit order. And remember what Protestants said. He fell back upon himself and he found the means to develop a spirituality not based on faith, but based on self. And he writes, the first thing that you have to do is composition. So you go to a little room and you have composition, seeing the place. So if you want to have an experience with Jesus Christ, then 
in your mind contemplate the scene, see the place. Here it is to be noted, in a visible contemplation or meditation, as for instance when one contemplates Christ the Lord, who is visible, the composition will be to see with the sight of the imagination the corporeal place where the thing is found, which I want to contemplate. So this is spirituality. I need a quiet little room. I need to contemplate this issue. I need to see it. And eventually it becomes such a reality I can actually talk to Christ or whoever I have visualized and I can have a one-to-one -one conversation. Here we can contemplate in our meditations, for example, on the sins and the composition we will see with the sight of the imagination and consider that my soul is imprisoned in this incorruptible body and so I have this experience. Then he says you start everyone with a particular prayer. It's like a mantra. You repeat it over and over and over again. He says the call of the temporal king to help to contemplate the life of the king eternal. So now we have idolatry. He says when you want to contemplate Jesus, that's too difficult. Let's take an earthly king. A marvelous earthly king who is, who is the epitome of Jesus. Well, who was he referring to? to the Pope. He says first you start with the composition, you see the place again, see it with your imagination, and then you put before me a human king chosen by God. Our Lord, whom all Christians, princes and men reverence and obey. Who's that? So I start imagining the Pope. Second point, the second is to look how this king speaks to all the people saying it is my will to conquer all the land for unbelievers therefore whoever would like to come with me is to be content to eat as I and to drink and to dress as I so I have to become poor excuse me I would have to become mega rich I would have to get myself a mobile and drive around in it third point is to consider what the good subjects ought to answer such a king then he talks about penance. He says penance must be interior and exterior. It's not enough to go to Jesus and say, Lord, I have sinned, forgive me. No, it's got to be exterior. I have to chastise myself. I have to punish myself. How do I punish myself? Fun. One way is I could tell my eating. That is to say, when we leave off the superfluous, it's not penance, but temperance. It is penance when we leave off from the suitable and the more and more, the better. So I start eating only what I absolutely need to stay alive. The bread crumbs and the this. And when it comes to sleeping, it's not enough to take off the superfluous. No, no, no. I don't need the soft things. You sleep on the hard floor. Preferably put nails under you. Now you can see why many of these orders, the nuns look so emaciated and cold and they sleep on hard floors and they're told what they may eat and nothing may taste good because you have to penance yourself. He goes further. He says you must chastise the flesh. That is giving sensible pain, which is giving by wearing hair cloth or cords of iron chains next to the flesh, by scourging or wounding oneself. This is his writing. I'm not making this up. So you have to beat yourself with whips. You have to wear chains. So that is why Opus Dei and all these groups wear pain anklets, so that when they move, they feel stabbing pain to be reminded of their commitments. This is horrendous. This is the modern Christianity. That's why in the Philippines they enact this and they beat themselves and they crucify themselves. This is spiritual exercises of Loyola. You have to pay for your sins. Faith says, my Lord died for me on the cross and paid my, for my sins for me. All I have to do is come in repentance to him. And then you progress. Once you've broken yourself down to this point, then you start progressing. And then you must praise much the religious orders. 
So your example is all the religious orders around. Virginity, that's marvelous. And continence. Praise vows of religions. Praise relics of the saints. So go to the relics and start feeling the bones and all of these issues and praise constitutions about fasts and abstinences of Lent, of ember days. So now we need lots of feast days to fill our lives. Can you see what he's, what he's contemplating here? Now you think this is 400 years old? I have shocking news for you. We must understand the exercises of Loyola if we want to understand the Jesuits. To have the true sentiments which we ought to have in the church militant, the first of all judgment laid aside. This is Loyola speaking, and here is his picture or his statue as a saint in the Vatican. First of all, judgment laid aside. What did Pope Benedict say? You have to be perende a cadaver like a corpse. And we ought to have our mind ready and prompt to obey in all the true spouse of Christ our Lord, which our Holy Mother, the Church Hierarchy. And hold that the white which I see is black if the hierarchical church so decides it. This is the spiritual exercises of Loyola. Blind obedience is absolutely essential. And this is the famous statement that they had to obey perendee at Kadava, like a corpse. You must have no mind of your own. Now is this dead? Or is this alive and well and destroying Protestantism today? That is the question we must ask ourselves. The spiritual exercises in today's world as expounded in National Jesuit News. Let's go to today. The spiritual exercises of Ignatius belong to the church. In, on their own, they involve lay and Jesuit colleagues in a fruitful way. They create spiritual conversation and community which Americans yearn for. They help religious women, offer women's gifts to the church and the world and help the laity find their own gifts confirmed by prayer. They offer an assured way to find God working in all things and a feasible project of living contemplative in action. Ooh, if you knew what these terms meant. Just Christians in the marketplace. We have a contemplative Christianity. They write, Ignatius of Loyola created and conducted this apostolate for 15 years before he was ordained. And he says, the history that spiritual exercises are proving an astonishingly effective instrument of lay spirituality even in the postmodern era today. They are, please note, this is a Jesuit organization writing. They are being used for and by and with lay people in many formats all around the world. And then supply the basis of sophisticated spiritualities for the marketplace. Well, they've got something to sell. And it is the road to hell that they have to sell. This is not biblical religion. It is safe to say that more people are going through the one-on-one -on -one directed exercises today than at any time in history. It is safe to say something more. Spiritual exercises are being used and as, as an apostolic instrument by better educated laity. So don't only think that the Jesuits are in control. They have trained an army of hundreds of thousands of lay people in their exercises. And how's it going to affect you? Here you can find it on their own web pages. Ignatian retreat and spiritual exercises in our day. Here is an eight-day Ignatian retreat. What more can I say? Eight-day Ignatian retreat for priests, religious deacons, lay ministers by so-and-so, come and discuss here and study the spiritual e exercises and other meditations. This book says, what more can I do? 
an Ignatian retreat for people somewhere on the way. Helps you explore and pray about what it means to serve. Serve whom? If you want to download the spiritual exercises to see if I'm making it up, go to the Jesuit Review. This is their own web page. You can go and check it out. And you can download the spiritual exercises. And they quote here, the first instrument of Jesuit Review offers an introduction to the spiritual exercises. You think they're dead? I'll show you where they are today. Tetloff, who's another Jesuit, writes, Philosophy continues at the heart of the Jesuit liberal arts curriculum because more than any other discipline it can provoke the intellectual conversion of the conventional thinker to principled reflection. Right, with that as background, let's go to our times. You've all heard of the Alpha Course? It is touted as probably the greatest ministerial tool in the history of Christianity. And we will progress from this humble beginning to where we will see we are today. It is scary, it is mind-boggling. The Alpha Course and Cell Group Philosophy. Now let me first, right off the bat, say there is nothing wrong with small group gatherings. It is God-given to have small group gatherings where people come together to study the Word of God and to find meaning in the Word of God. Beautiful, the more the better. But this is not Alpha Course. This is small group gatherings but on a totally different basis. And having gone through the spiritual exercises, let's see if we can find it. The founder of the, of the course, as it is written today, was Nicky Gumbel. And here he is. Well, where does it lead us? Let's read what the great Alpha web pages say. This is Alpha USA. What is Alpha? The Alpha course is a 10-week practical introduction to Christian faith. It gives people an opportunity to explore big life questions. Questions like, is there any point to life? What happens when I die? Alpha guests learn how Christianity answers these questions. Alpha course is for everyone. It sparks faith in people outside the church. It kindles the faith of new Christians and it fuels the commitment of long-time Christians. This is the greatest thing ever. Alpha guests explore Christianity by participating in 15 sessions that take place in a relaxed, welcoming, engaging atmosphere. Each session explores a particular question and then they have all the questions. They sound nice and innocuous, no problem. Is there more to life than this? Who is Jesus? Why did he die? Who is the Holy Spirit? What does the Holy Spirit do? How can I be filled with the Spirit? How can I make the most of the rest of my life? Sounds nice. No problem. Nobody should be concerned. The Power of Alpha by Rebecca Barnes, reprinted with permission. Since coming to the United States in 1996, the same year the Bishop of London appointed Gumbel Alpha Chaplain, Alpha has grown exponentially. The number of U.S. churches hosting the courses has increased from 200 the first year to more than 7,500 in 2005, and then they talk about how magnificent it is. And in, in May 2004, former Vineyard USA National Director Todd Hunter joined Alpha as its president, excited about the marriage of spiritual formation and evangelism that Alpha brings. Two terms we will have to come to grips with. He says in his blog, he calls the Alpha course the most holistic approach to evangelization available in local churches. Now let's see what Nicky Gumbel says. He says, the differences between Protestants and Catholics are totally insignificant compared to the things that unite us. We need to unite around the death of Jesus, the resurrection of Jesus, the absolute essential things at the core of the Christian faith. Who said that before? Vatican II said that. This is a Vatican II philosophy. We need to give people liberty to disagree on the things which are secondary. We make it a rule, he writes, Alpha, never to criticize another denomination, another Christian church or a Christian leader. No criticism allowed. Catholic Bishop says, Ambrose says, Alpha, 
is a powerful evangelistic tool. It doesn't contain anything that is contrary to Catholic doctrine. Fascinating. Did he meet the Pope? Yes, there he is with the Pope. It was a great honor to be presented to Pope John Paul, who has done so much to promote evangelization around the world. What unites us is infinitely greater than what divides us. And he has admitted that certain sections were particularly written so as to incorporate Catholicism. So this is an ecumenical tool to unite with Christianity. Now Alpha News, which is their great news magazine, tells us some interesting things. The Holy Spirit is mediated through the hands of the leaders. So in Alpha, one of the aims is to be led to this spirit experience. It makes the reception of the Holy Spirit and outward manifestations the mark of the faith. The published testimonies come out of Alpha nearly always concentrate on the Holy Spirit experience. So it leads us to this marvelous experiential religion. Howbeit when he, the Spirit of truth, is come, says John 16, 13 to 14, he will guide us into all truth. And he shall not speak of himself, but whatever he shall hear, that he shall speak, and he will show you things to come. He shall glorify me, says Jesus, for he shall receive of mine and shall show it unto you. So what is the aim of the Holy Spirit? To glorify Christ. To enable us to spread the gospel. Not to have an experience. It's not biblical. Now let me tell you about cell groups. Cell groups like the Alpha Course cell group also fall under a coach or a spiritual director, just like Ignatius Loyola's story. They are designed to bring people to consensus theology, no argument is allowed, celebration liturgy, and to sacrificing of individual norms to group norms and dynamics using peer pressure. Let's have a look. I'm taking these quotes from the manual to the Protestant churches. These are mainline Protestant churches teaching the Alpha Course. And I'm going to quote from them, directly from their manual. Here we go. A cell group has a host, a leader, a Timothy, and a participant. A cell group caters for pastoral care, individual need, and has a specific structure and duration. It's very controlled. It's not a group of people coming together to discuss the Bible or to talk about prophecy and see what the Bible has to say. It forms the bridge between the people and the church. Every group member is evangelized, consolidated, built up as a disciple, and sent. Duration of a session is one hour, starts with an introduction, Praise, prayer, subject, application, final activities. Deviation from the format is not permitted. I'm quoting directly from the handbook to the Protestant churches. Please note. Also, members are not permitted to change cell groups. You will remain in this one. And murmuring and criticism is not permitted. Unity of thought, feelings, and commitment are sought. The disciples in the cell vision cannot operate independently of their leader. Unity is the symbol of maturity. So you will stay in your group. You will have consensus theology. You may not murmur. You may not find fault, seek error. And you will be submissive. We will have consensus theology at the end. Anything that is... Mm, shaky, we will discard. You may not talk about it. This is about unity. Models for success. Declare that success is yours. This is nothing else than the power of positive thinking. Persevere, dream, and visualize. Oh, let's see how they work. Obedience and respect for leadership is essential. How is an Ignatian retreat? Perinde Kadava. Even if your leader turns out to be a dog, you will obey him without question, said Loyola. The leader will seek counsel of his or her trained superiors in the church 
and the trust of his or her disciples. Moreover, the disciples must be encouraged to confide in the leader regarding their problems. Excuse me. What do we have here? This is Roman Catholicism as its best. The leader takes the place of a priest. He becomes the father confessor. He's absolute. You may not question him. And he gets his counsel where he is trained. And you are trained in specific schools of training. Fascinating. Let's continue. We have a 12 around 1 model. Please, what am I quoting for? I just want to remind you, I'm not making this up. Where am I quoting this from? From the handbook to the Protestant churches. Jesus took three and a half years to train the 12, and so cell groups used the 12 around 1 concept. Jesus did not choose 13, but 12. With teams of 12, we commenced to restore the altar of God in the world. Excuse me. The secret is in the 12. The model of 12 has always been in God's heart and the number symbolizes government and authority. So now we have numerism. So it becomes a cult. Because if you don't have this 12, well then you must try and improve. Always try to get to the 12. You can work without the 12, but that's the, mo the model and the aim. So the number becomes important. By the way, if you have 12 around 1, then the spiritual guide takes the place of whom? Takes the place of Christ. He becomes an altar Christ. And did Christ send only out 12? Or did he send out 70 or any number? Here's the government of 12 definition. Comes from there. I put down the page even so that people can see it. A revolutionary leadership model that consists of the leader who chooses 12 people, now please note what is being said here, this is incredible, who chooses 12 people so that his or her character and authority can be reproduced in them so that the vision of the church can be developed. Ah! So, if you are a cell group member, the highest you can rise is to the level of your spiritual leader. God forbid that we should aim that low. Why not make Christ your model and have infinity to strive for? Sorry, let me rephrase that. To be uplifted to. Now let me show you something else. Here is the web page of the Rosicrucian Order. Probably one of the most occult orders in the world. The Rosicrucian Fellowship. Like all the other mystery orders, the order of Rosicrucians is formed on cosmic lines. If we take balls of even size and try to, how many it will take to cover one and hide it from you, we shall find that it will require 12. We don't have to read it all. It says, there were 12 apostles that clustered around Christ. There are others examples of this grouping of 12 and 1. The Rosicrucian order, therefore, also composed of 12 brothers and a 13th. Satan wants to be like the Most High. And Jesus had 12 tribes of Israel, and he had 12 apostles, and he was the centrality, the old passing over to the new. Satan wants to be like the Most High, but he makes it an occult tool. We don't need a specific structure in order to worship Christ. The Bible says where how many come together? Two or three come together. In my name, I will be there. I don't have to have an occult number in order to uh, conjure the Spirit. This is nonsense. In the section on intercession we read, intercession is necessary to confirm the team of 12, to satisfy the need of the group of 12, to enjoy protection from evil, to attain sanctification, to build and maintain like-mindedness, to raise up the disciples to the same level of servitude as their mentors. Good grief. Who's left out of this equation here? Jesus Christ is left out. A mentor 
is described as someone with a priestly commission who is merciful and sympathetic and approved and holy. So now you must look upon him as holy and approved. Texts quoted include passages from the Gospel of John, etc., etc. This is Ignatian spirituality. It's based on Jesuit principles and it's in virtually every Protestant church in the world. 1 Corinthians 14, I thank my God I speak with tongues more than all of you. They say what we need, but it's positive aspects. They lay a lot of claim on healing, prophecy, power, miracles, tongues. This is the manifestation that they seek. What did Martin Luther say about this? The true way to Christianity is this. I like this man, you know that? I like this man. The true way to Christianity is this, that a man do first acknowledge himself by the law to be a sinner. There's no mentioning of sin in all those writings. This is a totally new gospel that they have. Martin Luther says the first thing is you have to acknowledge you're a sinner. And that it is impossible for him to do any good work. For the law says thou art an evil tree and therefore all that thou thinkest, speakest or doest is against God. And he quotes Matthew. For whosoever is not of faith, whatsoever is not of faith is sin. When a man is thus taught and instructed by the law, then is he terrified and humbled, then he sees indeed the greatness of his sin, cannot find himself in himself one spark of the love of God, therefore he justifies God in his word and confesses that he is guilty of death and eternal damnation. The first part then of Christianity is the preaching of repentance and the knowledge of ourselves. Boom! Exact opposite of the Alpha Course. What they want when they study the Bible together is isogesis and not exegesis. Exegesis is determining what is the Bible trying to tell me, what is God trying to tell me. Isogesis is what do I think God is saying. There's a big difference. That's why today we have modern translations which are dynamic equivalent translations. That means that some theologian has pre-digested for me what he thinks God is saying. Excuse me, don't I have a mind of my own to find out what God is saying? Ignatius, this is a professor of the University of Bonn talking about the Jesuits. Ignatius understood more than any other leader of men who preceded him that the best way to raise a man to a certain ideal is to become master of his imagination. We imbue into him spiritual forces which he would find very difficult to eliminate later. Forces more lasting than all the best principles and doctrines. These forces can come up again to the surface sometimes after years of not even mentioning them. It's a form of hypnosis and becomes so imperative that the will finds itself unable to oppose any obstacle and has to follow their irresistible impulse. This is hypnosis. This is not Christianity. Ignatius was influenced by what is called the golden legend. It was especially attracted by the extraordinary feats of penance performed by the Egyptian monks who beat themselves and chastised themselves until eventually they had these experiences. The basis of spiritual exercises is pictorial imagining in which one brings every sense under the impact of the imagination. An exercise called composition, seeing the place. The imagination is closed with visible form, the object is fixed and the imagination becomes reality. Today we call this exercise visualization. It's practiced at school level. The little children in schools are taught it. It's part of the new curriculums. The Jesuits have it all under control. It's practiced from primary to tertiary education. It's a disaster. Moral judgment becomes suspended and you live in this euphoria. Now a Jesuit retreat lasts four weeks. They are run by a retreat master or a guide or a coach. What do they call these people when we are educated by them in Protestant churches? We call them guides, we call them coats, we call them retreat masters. They don't even hide it. 
Only the director who has grasped the mind and the heart of the Ignatian spirituality, which is distinguished service to Christ, can fulfill his task of adapting the exercises to the precise needs of the individual or group to whom he is speaking. Fascinating. An experienced retreat martyr who knows the exercises well will make numerous little adjustments in his approaches to the meditation to fit the education, temperament, role, age bracket, and interest of the audience. So they're not all the same. Listen to what this ex-priest, new age priest has to say, Will Barron. He says, this ritual was very deceptive. The average Christian would probably find nothing seriously objectionable about the phrases used, yet this meditation procedure was a product of Satan. Designed to lead people into accepting the voice of masquerading demons as being the voice of the Holy Spirit. Some of these people, we've read it in the newspapers, suddenly heard voices and these voices started telling them, those are the enemies of Christ, go and kill them. And then they go and do these things. You will get what you are trying to experience. Now listen what the Protestant magazine Christianity Today has to say. This was Billy Graham's magazine. It says spiritual direction is one of the classical Christian disciplines that people from a wide variety of Protestant Catholic and Orthodox backgrounds are examining and recommending anew. Spiritual direction as practiced today, especially in the Roman Catholic Church, owes its greatest debt to the founder of the Society of Jesus. They know it. They know it and they introduce it. There is no doubt that this is a counter-reformation led by the Jesuit order. The article continues that Loyola's retreats focused on sin and its consequences in the lives of participants, the life of Christ, the guidelines to deal with temptation of the devil, the passion, the resurrection, all of these nice themes. Now what does the Bible say about spiritual directors? Micah 7 says, Trust ye not in a friend, Put not confidence in a guide. Keep the doors of thy mouth from her that lieth in thy bosom. Not even the one you love is allowed to dictate to you in your spirituality. No one. This is a relationship that you have with Jesus Christ and him alone. Martin Luther says, The spirit is nowhere more, nowhere more present and alive than in his own sacred writing. We must let the scriptures have the chief place and be its own truest, simplest, and clearest interpreter. I want scripture alone to rule and not to be interpreted according to my spirit or that of any other man, but to be understood in its own light, per sipsum, and according to its own spirit. I don't need a spiritual guide to tell me what to believe. I need the word of God. Amen. That's what he said. But not today. We need spiritual directors. We need coaches. We need to experience exercises. This writer says, Let all be educated to search the scriptures, to be constantly looking unto Jesus and not to human agents to be their guide. The word of God is to be the man of our counsel. The word is infinite, obeyed, it will guide us into safe and sure paths. But the word diluted with human devices and imaginings is not a safe guide. Exactly the same as Martin Luther said. God wants to do something for each one of us. This work is an individual work. Please note. A personal work. Students do not pretend depend on your teachers to form your character. For Christ's sake, make your characters individually. Take hold of God and do not think that you have to be always with your teacher in order to be solid workers. We are to represent God to the world to show what is the truth has done for us right on this ground. We want to see the moving of the Holy Spirit. You will remember that the Holy Spirit so worked in the schools of the prophets that when Saul hunted for the Hunting for David came in connection with one of these schools. The Spirit came upon him and he prophesied. But we need something more lasting than Saul had. Take hold of God. You have little enough time in which to form characters fit for the future. 
Exodus says, You shall not follow a multitude to do evil, neither shall you speak in a cause to decline of the many to rest judgment. Luther said, according to the great controversy, the influence of this one man who dared to think and act for himself in religious matter was to affect the church and the world, not only in his own time, but in all future generations. He has one man. He decided, I'm going to stick to the word. I don't care what the Pope says. I don't care what the Archbishop says. I want to know what does the word say. Please don't misunderstand me. Am I saying don't seek the counsel of religious, learned men? Am I saying that? I'm not saying that. In the counsel of many there is wisdom. But don't let anyone dictate to you what you must believe. That's what I'm saying. And let alone try to reach the level of your spiritual guide and confess to him all that you have done. Confess your sins to Jesus. And if you have hurt someone, go and say sorry to him, irrespective of there's, if there's a coach or a spiritual guide hiding in the woodwork. Matthew 23, 8 to 10. But be not called rabbi, for one is your master, even Christ, and all ye are brethren, and call no man your father upon this earth. For one is your father which is in heaven, neither ye be called masters, for one is your master, even Christ. Is what I'm saying biblical? Master, catechetes, a guide, that is a teacher, a master. I don't need one of them to tell me what to believe. That doesn't mean I cannot study what they have said and compare it with the Word of God. By these words, Christ meant that no man is to place his spiritual interests under another as a child is guided and directed by an earthly father. This has encouraged the spirit of desire for ecclesiastical superiority, which has always resulted in the injury of men who have trusted and addressed as father. It confuses the sense of the sacredness of the prerogatives of God. Spot on. As an earlier age, the special truths for this time are found not with the ecclesiastical authorities, but with men and women who are not too learned or too wise to believe the word of God. If you want confusion in the world, then believe every theologian out there. They differ as far as the East is from the West. Take any aspect. Take baptism. You have churches that baptize, baptize adults. Some of them sprinkle them. Some of them pour a little water over them. You have people that baptize them seven times. You have people that dump them three times. You have people that say only infants must be baptized. The list is endless. And it's thought up by the theologians. I have nothing against godly theologians. And I've, I enjoy reading their writings and studying it and comparing it with the word of God. We can be led by godly men, but that doesn't mean that these people are your, to be your guide and certainly not your pope. Our great weakness is in placing men where God should be to be looked up and confided in. I don't believe we need any of these fixed structures. I believe in small groups. I believe in coming together and studying the Bible and praying together and seeking counsel from the Lord. And I believe in asking counsel of learned men who have studied these things more than I have. Yes, but I believe in the paramount superiority of the Word of God. And every single thing must be tested by that Word. Psalms 32 verse 8. I will instruct thee and teach thee in the way which thou shalt go. I will guide thee with mine eye. God wants a personal relationship with you and me. The gospel is not about things. The gospel is not about rituals. The gospel is not about magic formulas and magic numbers. The gospel is not about chastisement to see greater light. The gospel is a relationship. And God has put men and women on this earth and marriage as an example of that relationship. God forbid if I would have to whip myself daily to get the attention of my wife. Wouldn't that be pathetic? 
Isaiah 48, 17, Thus says the Lord thy Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, I am the Lord thy God, which teaches thee to profit, which leadeth thee by the way that thou shouldst go. Trust in the Lord your God, trust in his word, and no one needs to be lost. May God help us as we further study the inroads of spiritual exercises to take the place of faith. It's going to become very serious. Thank you.